No, good, good afternoon to you all, and uh, thank you very much uh, for, for inviting me. Uh, I, I have just come to say just a few remarks uh, in, in what must be a dialogue. Yeah. Uh, in, in what must be a dialogue, because uh, I must say, when I was invited by a group called Women in Leadership uh, and Leverage, I, I became afraid. Okay? <laughs> okay? Because uh, I'm probably not an expert in talking about issues in, in, that, uh, in, in, that, in that field. Uh, uh, but I did think that uh, there is some work uh, that I've been doing uh, together with others over time and that the work that we've been doing might benefit from a dialogue, from, uh, from, from what you've been doing, so that we can work together uh, 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 you know, o o over the next while. And, um, and of course, uh, I had to educate myself, and I'm sure you, you all read uh, that issue of nature uh, uh, during that week of International Women's Day uh, in, in, in March, uh, in which there was a series of articles on the position of women in science. Um, and, uh, and, and there was um, a, a, a summary here, which, which I will just go over, uh, illustrating what is happening globally, because quite clearly the issues that Will is dealing with are not just South African issues. They are global issues. Uh, and, and what uh, the, the analysts here are looking at is the state of women in science, particularly uh, in North America, in Europe, and in a few other countries. And uh, this summary slide in one of the papers there is looking at what's happening at graduate level, at postgraduate level, early career, as well as uh, women as they move now into tenure uh, to take positions in science. Uh, the, the good news is that the proportion of women going into PhDs uh, in, in American schools, and I think also in this country, my sense is that the proportion is, is increasing, as you can see here in the US, uh, from about 40% to nearly half uh, are women uh, going into PhD programs. And there are some countries like Ethiopia where the majority of PhD students are, are women or, 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 or already, although countries are at different levels uh, of development. But it is clear that as you progress up the ladder, there is an attrition rate, there is a loss uh, 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 in the sense that when you look at representation of women, let's say in the professoriate, which is what this is illustrating, uh, you find that there are a lot fewer women who are full professors compared to those, uh, co compared to men, uh, for example. So there, there, there are lots of hurdles along the way uh, in terms of improving the position of women, so much so that the summary really of this series uh, uh, that, that, that is in, uh, in nature is that uh, science, in fact, remains institutionally racist, uh, sorry, sexist, <laughs> sexist. <laughs> that, that, that issue of institutional racism is a, is a topic for another day. Uh, it remains institutionally uh, sexist. Uh, there is progress, uh, but there is, it is clear that there are still major disparities. Uh, disparities related to pay, uh, re re disparities related, re uh, related to promotion, disparities relating to grants, uh, where women write the same grants, and it appears that perhaps men uh, win them more than women. And in fact, uh, when you look at the sizes of grants awarded, I mean, there are nice studies actually uh, showing that men often get given bigger grants than, than, than the women. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, there are quite a few uh, 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 problems and uh, uh, barriers that make women to leave science altogether. Uh, so, so, so this is really a great area of work and, 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 and I think uh, Will has identified an important issue which, uh, which uh, will, will occupy us for a long time to come. Now, what I want to do though, because as I say, I'm not an expert on the gender gap. Uh, in this country, and in fact, towards the end, I'm going to be asking questions of Will, uh, so that Will maybe can inform me about this particular issue. But what I thought I should look at, uh, because I think uh, all of us can benefit from what has happened in order to address this issue, uh, what, what I thought I will do is just to ask a, a, a series of questions about uh, uh, people who are in science uh, and who are in leadership in science. And, and I will use science here to refer to medical science because um, uh, we are largely in medical science. 
And, and, and the first question I, I want to uh, just pose is, what do we know about the state of, of the science cohort in South Africa? Right? What is the data? What, what, what is the data? Uh, I think for some time, there has been a feeling that uh, there aren't enough researchers who are doing medical research in South Africa. And, and, and I think that feeling is based on reasonable data. And I'll show you just two slides. The first one here uh, is, a, is an old slide now coming from the Department of Science and Technology. And, and what it's showing you is, is the age of South Africans who are publishing, right? Who, who are publishing in all fields of science. Uh, so this includes medical science, physics, in the whole science system in South Africa. What you will see is that if you look at 1990, and uh, you will see that in 1990, 6% of them were under the age of 30, 33% of them were between the ages of 30 and 39, 41% uh, were between the ages of 40 and 49, 18% were between the ages of 50 and 59, and 2% were over the age of uh, uh, age of, over, over the age of 60. And then what you see over a 12-year period is a very interesting phenomenon whereby the proportions of younger producers of knowledge is, is in fact decreasing. So, uh, whereas it was 6% of people under 30 who were publishing in 1990, it was 1% by, uh, by, by, by 2002. And, uh, and then what you see, in fact, is that uh, for the age groups under 50, there is a diminishing proportion for those under 50. And in fact, 50% uh, of people were producing knowledge were easily over the age of, of 50. In, 19, uh, in the year 2002. Now, this trend actually continued. Sure. Right? It, it, it continued right up to the, towards the end of the, uh, of, of, of the uh, uh, to, towards, uh, you know, 2010. It continued, right? Yeah. And you could see it actually even in universities. When universities were analyzing UCT, like we could see this trend even at UCT. And even myself, uh, when, when, uh, when uh, the position of head of medicine came up in Cape Town, I was doing my research very happy, uh, and, uh, um, and then this job came up, and, and uh, people said, why aren't you applying? I said, they must give me a good reason. And one of the reasons that was given was that, look, uh, there's a need for younger people, okay, to, to take this type of jobs. And when we looked at the professors of medicine in Cape Town and the senior consultants, the average age in 2005 was 57. Yeah? The average age of the consultants, the leaders, in the day was 57. So it became, I became very worried that there's no one's going to teach my kids, okay, mm -hmm. medicine. So I took, I, I took up the, 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 the job. Uh, and, uh, uh, so, so, so what I'm trying to illustrate is that that phenomenon was, 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 was a key one. So what I was showing here is that the uh, pipeline is not being replenished. There aren't younger people who are coming in. You've got a group that is frozen and that is getting, uh, that is getting smaller. And then... Then the next statistic here, this is a slide uh, from, from Slim, uh, which he showed at the uh, National Health Research Summit uh, in July of 2011, which is illustrating a second point uh, about, uh, about the South Africans who are producing knowledge. And that point is that there are probably too few of them, right? So, so we've shown that they are, uh, 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 they are aging and they're not being replenished. But when you look at the number of full-time equivalent researchers per thousand of the total of working people in the country, right, you find that in South Africa that number is uh, is 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 is, is two point two, all right, per thousand, and, and that's in comparison we would like to think ourselves as belonging to BRICS, huh? you know, of, of of being part of the club of uh, of uh, Brazil. Russia, India, uh, uh, you know, and, and some of those big countries. And, and we can see that Russia, in terms of numbers of researchers, is, 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 is much better than, than we're doing. So, in terms of the science cohort in South Africa, certainly up until 2010, right, we were seeing a situation where it was small, it was getting older, and, 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 and a tiny group of people were producing research. So, that, that's, that's a situation that we were seeing. Uh, what has been the impact of this? I mean, did it really have relevance? Because some people have argued that even though it was small, it was efficient. It was actually very good. And, and, and that's quite correct. Okay? That small number of producers of knowledge actually producing high quality knowledge. Um, but uh, is, it, is it sustainable to maintain such a small and an aging cohort of, uh, of scientists uh, in the country? 
What you saw, when, particularly when you looked at health sciences, and this is an analysis that was done for the uh, Academy of Science of South Africa report, uh, and it looked just an absolute numbers of, uh, of articles that are deposited in the ISI database, and that sort of tracked them from 1996 to about 2005. Um, so, uh, so what you see, particularly when you focus at, at, at clinical research, uh, what you see is that up until uh, 2000, it appeared that the absolute numbers uh, were increasing. Of course, we haven't adjusted this for the denominator of the producers, but we know, I've already shown you that the producers were not, were not necessarily increasing in this period. But you then hit a period of stagnation in terms of the absolute numbers, and then from about 2003, there was an, an inflection in the wrong direction, right? And, and this actually continued right up to about 2009, okay? Particularly in clinical science. In the areas of basic lab production, as well as population research, uh, South Africa actually, in terms of these absolute numbers, we were holding our own, but as you can see, in terms of our total numbers, because clinical science actually accounts for the bulk of the production from the South African system, we were beginning now to dip, showing you that uh, that situation that we had of not replenishing of our pool of producers was, was actually now beginning to have, to have an impact, because you cannot sustain that uh, for, for, for too long. Um, and this issue of productivity, uh, 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 you know, Slim also looked at it uh, when he presented at that meeting in July of uh, 2011, uh, where he looked, for example, at the numbers of papers per million inhabitants in South Africa, so that he controlled for the size of the country now. Uh, and you find that here in South Africa, uh, we were one per million, right? Even Cuba was much better than us. Uh, and I mean, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, comparing ourselves to Cuba, right? Yeah, we should be doing uh, much better than that. You might say Brazil uh, was playing in the same ballpark, but, but Brazil was in fact going up. Uh, the trajectory for Brazil was this way, whereas the trajectory for us was in, uh, actually in that particular direction. So there's no doubt that uh, the diminishing size of the science cohort, as well as uh, uh, the, um, uh, the you know the failure to, uh, to 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 introduce new schemes, to introduce new people, was having a detrimental imp effect on the size of productivity. You may well ask. I mean, we like showing these statistics of bad things happening. Uh, you know, what, what was done about it? I mean, the, the good news is that actually something was done about it. Uh, so, so this problem was brought to the attention of Naledi Pandu uh, when she was Minister of, of Science and Technology around uh, 2006, 2007. And, and what she then did uh, was to ask the Academy of Science of South Africa to, to do a study of this particular issue. Uh, and uh, the Academy uh, um, of Science of South Africa then put together a panel uh, that uh, was to study uh, clinical research and related training in South Africa with a view to seeing how we can revitalize clinical research in South Africa. Uh, and this team was put together in about 2000 and end of 2007, 2008. Uh, I, was, uh, I was fortunate to uh, be the chair of this 13-member panel uh, and the way that, that these panels work of the academy is that they are actually consensus panels where you have to get all those 13 members to agree you know, on, on what is the problem to make the diagnosis, as I put it here, and then to try to agree with 13 people of what's the right therapy, you know, right? Uh, uh, right uh, and the key issue was about producing recommendations that are actionable. I think all of us like writing these reports and we come up with these recommendations that no one can do anything about. Okay? So, so what Naledi said, look, the recommendations must be things we can do something about. Okay, uh, and there must be things that are directed to DST, uh, directed to, to DOH, directed to higher education, that are directed to DTI, because this is a complex of departments, in fact, that is key uh, in the science uh, uh, production system of this, of this particular country. And uh, we, uh, we worked, uh, we worked and, and then towards the end of 2009, we produced a report. And, and I'll take you uh, through uh, some of the highlights of the report. I brought a book for Will. Has, has Will read the book? No. Yeah? no. I'll put, maybe we can put it in your library, right? Okay, okay but uh, maybe uh, Will can read this report. Because it is an important report uh, uh, in, in that it, it did identify what were the key problems um, with respect to uh, clinical research or even health research in, in this country. 
and this is this is why this is important you know the, the, the first issue being the whole issue of public engagement with research and this is this great strategic issue that we've got to get right okay whereby the southern public and our politicians seem to be very suspicious of research yeah. as if research is a bad thing we have to sort that out i come across people particularly from the departments of health talking about a concept that they call over research i have never heard of that <laughs> over research is good right it's good for people people who are in research studies live longer hmm? right even if it's a question that is being administered to them because someone picks up what's wrong and they get they get treatment so we must encourage our politicians that over research is a good thing for Africans. In fact, we need to get all the 50 million Africans in your research project. They'll do well. All right, yeah? Because they think that being in multiple protocols is bad. You know, um, I, I worked uh, in Oxfordshire in England, 650,000 people. You know, I worked on, 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 on a lot of families. Each person who was in my study was in a, in, in a couple of other studies. You know, they were in the, in, the, in the heart study, which is what I was doing. They were in the brain MRI study. They were in a GI study. And, and, and the population of Oxfordshire, you must look at their outcomes, okay, right? They are much better in all of England. And you must wonder why. They are in research studies. They're in multiple protocols, right? Yeah. So we must dispel that myth. We're not working hard enough on this, on educating the public to ask for research, right? Yeah. Educating our journalists that research is good, right? Educating our politicians that they must create conditions for research. And, and, and we, can, we can have a conference on this, on how research can, in fact, make South Africa to be successful economically, okay? Because that's where knowledge lies and so on. So we are not doing enough, and, and I'm blaming all of us here in this room, uh, to turn the public around. And as a result of that, uh, the state is not planning properly for research. Uh, the regulatory regime is negative. It reflects the idea that research is bad, uh, and, and, and there isn't coordination. Uh, and this, and that, uh, flowing from that, clearly, uh, uh, the capacity for clinical research has not been built uh, in terms of people being trained and infrastructure being set up, uh, and uh, uh, and the funding, of course, is is, is, is not good, uh, and there isn't a feedback loop that's looking at what is actually coming out, how can we translate it into policy programs and practice, and how can we do better? So, so so that the the, the research system, there isn't a research system. I think that's what we were saying uh, in this report, and and what we said. Uh, ought to happen is that uh, at a national level there needs to be a stronger strategic steer on health research. We said the National Health Research Committee needed to wake up and, and take and, and take uh, up its, its responsibilities. Uh, this is a problem that needed to be sorted out uh, in terms of having a far better regulatory regime that facilitates uh, a research facilitates research uh, and the National Research Ethics Committee and these need to to, to work uh, to work together. Uh, for an appropriate regulation, planning, and coordination of health research in this country. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we need people to do research. And, and this is where we first called uh, for what was called a, a National Clinical Scholars Program that would produce 500 PhDs over 10 years, as well as dedicated research chairs uh, as, as part of the Human, resource, uh, research, uh, human Resources for, for, for Health Research uh, Plan. Uh, and then we said facilities needed to be created uh, in the, the new King Edward Hospital, I hope, uh, we'll have a research ward and we'll have clinical research center within it so that um, you know uh, so we can expand the opportunities that have been established here at Caleb and at Doris Duke which have been done by private money that ought to be the state that's creating those types of facilities in the academic health complexes in, in particular so that when we for example are discussing with the province we're not only discussing the teaching platform and the service platform we're discussing the research platform that must be funded appropriately uh, uh, in, in our system uh, we said that uh, the new money must come from uh, all organizations in society, top slicing a certain proportion of their budgets for, 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 for R&D. Uh, and of course, there needed to be a monitoring and evaluation system of the performance of individuals, of research institutions, research councils, government departments, and, and, and private industry. We already have actually some sort of a system here for looking at performance of individuals, which is the NRF rating system, but it's purely voluntary. Uh, as to who gets rated by the NRF uh, or not. We don't have, for example, what they have in the UK, which is called the research assessment exercise, that from time to time looks at how organizations and universities and departments are performing so that their funding actually is related to how effective they are in using, uh, uh, in using the, uh, the taxpayers' money. So we produced that report, 
got published in, in, in 2010. Uh, and then you may well ask, I mean, the South Africans are very good at producing reports. Eh? They love the workshop and the report, and they move on to the next one, eh? with, with that other report not having been uh, uh, acted upon. And one of the things that we said is that group of 13, that we're not writing another report until this is this is implemented. <laughs> okay, right? okay. So we were there in the lady's office and, 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 and the Department of Health. I must tell you that uh, there has been some progress, and I'll share that progress with you briefly. Um, and, and the first thing that happened, actually, that was, that was very, very important, was the National Department of Health coming into the game of health research in this country. Uh, and the reason they came in was because actually in terms of their 10-point plan, the 10th point of the 10-point plan is strengthening research and development, right? Uh, and, uh, and then um, uh, um, the National Health Research uh, 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 Committee uh, then put together a National Health Research Summit in July of 2011. And the idea there was to set priorities for health research in South Africa. It was actually a very good meeting. I'm sure some of you may well have been in that meeting. Uh, there were about 300 people there from all stakeholders, from industry, from academia, from government, from local councils, you know, from the research councils, and, and, uh, and, and we haggled uh, for two days as to what, what is the priority for health research in South Africa. Now, these meetings traditionally end up with a long list of, of topics going all, uh, over all the world. Eh? It is AIDS, it is TB, it is my disease, that is the priority. But that meeting actually made a decision which was key. It said that the priority for South Africa is to build a national health research system, full stop. Because if we have a national health research system, the, the health system will be able to respond to any problem with appropriate research. And it also said that the Department of Health actually needs research as part of the Department of Health. That was the key shift in thinking. And therefore, the meeting said, okay, if we're saying the priority is to build a national health research system, what does the system need? Okay? And the first point is that the system needs fuel. It needs money. You know? If you are not putting money into a system, there will be no system. So it said that the first thing that was needed was that there needs to be appropriate investment by government in health research. Because a lot of the health research in this country, 70% or more of it, is funded from outside. It's funded from externally. No self-respecting country should be allowing that. Okay? Because clearly the agenda will be set by the external funders. If the Department of Health wants us to do research, we must set the money aside and put out a call. Re you know, researchers understand that very well. They, 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 they understand the RFA very, very well. So that's what, that's, what, that's what was said. At the time, when we made an analysis of the, uh, of the, of the budget of the Department of Health in 2011, and in 2011, it was uh, about 112 billion. Um, only 447 million was, was clearly going to health research, MRC, Health Systems Trust, and a few others, right? And then we said that the minister ought to increase this over a reasonable period of time, and that's probably the minimum that the minister should be actually spending on health research in, in this country. I think the good news is that uh, they, this was accepted, and, uh, and, and there are moves already to increase this by increasing the budget of the MRC, as well as a whole host of, of other initiatives to try to move closer to that. And then the second point that the meeting made was that a system needs people. Okay, if you're going to build a health research system, you need people. In this country, there isn't an, a national system for producing human resources for health research. Right? And, uh, and then it was said that we needed what is called a national health scholars program. And there was a little bit of ambition now uh, in the meeting, which said that we, we needed to, to, the Department of Health needed to fund a thousand PhDs over the next 10 years, right? Uh, so as to at least double the number of existing researchers, but this program must be a program funded from the Department of Health budget as part of its own human resources for health plan uh, uh, that, that, that seeks not only to fund PhDs, but MSCs, PhDs, postdocs, uh, mid-career people, research chairs, right? So that there could be people who sit in this post for the, for, 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 from cradle to grave, if you like, as academics, right? So this was accepted in principle, and I will comment on it uh, as to the implementation of this uh, of this particular program. What has what has happened? Right? Uh, and then the uh, and then the next point, of course, uh, in a system you need infrastructure, and we've already commented on this. The need for clinical research centers that are funded by the state, uh, and then 
if the state wants research to be done on its priorities, it must create major grants for projects, right? It must create major grants for projects. Uh, and we call this the National Priorities Research Fund, right? Yeah. So if uh, Minister Matsualeri wants to improve, uh, I'm not sure what uh, today, uh, he just needs to put money aside. The, the, the researchers will respond, right? Uh, and then, uh, they, they, and then, of course, regulation is key, both at an ethical level as well as uh, uh, the regulatory regime that's associated with MCC, and there's obviously already reform here to create a new structure uh, that uh, that will deal with that. But uh, we caution that we need to make sure that this new structure is not compounding the problems that already exist. And then a good research system must be able to take now the outputs of the research and translate them into policy, practice and programs in a predictable manner. Okay, right, yeah. At the moment, uh, you know, how your research gets adopted by the Department of Health, I don't know. But right, yeah, there isn't a system. He who shouts the loudest often gets, you know, their, their, you know, their, their, their findings implemented. That's not right. Okay, fine. We need a system uh, to get research into policy and practice and programs, right? Uh, and of course, some systems have got ways of doing that uh, in the NHS in the UK. They've got the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. Uh, which which does this in a, in a in a predictable manner that we can all all understand. We plug the, we plug our paper in there, it gets considered, and then it gets decided whether the country can afford it. You know, at the end of the day, we need we need that. That needs to be part of the new system, particularly with the NHI uh, coming uh, coming on stream. And then finally, you clearly need to plan. Uh, you clearly need to monitor, and you need to to evaluate so that you've got a feedback loop uh, that tells you are you spending enough. Are you producing the right uh, uh, health researchers? Have you got the right infrastructure? Are you, have you got the right projects? How's your regulatory regime doing? How are you translating? So there's a health research system. And this is a great task, really, of, uh, of transforming uh, the South African system so that it, it, so that, so that it works. Now, there, there's a lot of activity in all of these seven pillars of the new health research system for South Africa. But the one that's relevant to transforming the uh, the health uh, 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 the the, uh, the science cohort is in fact this one that is about people uh, the national health scholars program. Um, some of you in this room uh, are probably aware of this program because it was launched uh, in, in, in Parliament uh, um, in about February time, and, and there has been a call. Uh, so those of you, there was a call that went out just before Christmas. Okay, it went out on purpose because we wanted to find those who are ready to apply for PhDs. And the strategic approach with this program is that we are targeting young entry-level academics in academic departments who've just finished their professional qualifications, who are ready to launch their careers, but they've got no time to build it because of clinical duties and other duties. So what we do here, we then pay them the same amount they would have earned if they were working in their posts in the hospital. The same amount. We say, how much are you earning? Okay, we'll give you that amount. But we take you off for four years to do that. You can get, get a locum to work for you in that period so that you come back to your post and you continue, right? If you're successful with the PhD, by that time, hopefully, we'll be having postdoctoral funding, right? Maybe you're successful, by that time, we'll be having mid-career funding and research chair. So what it does is that it increases the capacity of academic departments to absorb talented people and then to also train them. Uh, so we uh, will probably be funding about 40 this year of these types of scholars. And within three to four years, we'll be funding at least 100 a year. The key point here in the application process, very simple. There are four pages that you have to fill. The first page, you need to tell people why you've got merit, why you're a good guy, you know, who should be funded. The second one is your science. Why is the science actually going to change the world, okay? The third one is a supervisor who has got a proven record of supervising. And the supervisor could be anywhere in the world, okay? Could be in Japan, you know, it doesn't matter, right? And then finally, there ought to be a lab, of course, where you're going to work that has got the PCR machine, huh? Okay, fine, and right, yes, just those four. If you can satisfy us on those four points, you're on your way, okay, fine? You'll, 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 you'll get the, the funding. Uh, and, uh, and then we're obviously selecting, so it's a hugely competitive process, simply because we are targeting everyone in the health system. 
it turned out that there were something like 26 professions in the Department of Health that could do a PhD, that, that are degree-based. Okay, fine. So uh, when the competition happens, people get considered in these baskets, eh? medical scientists on their own, physiotherapists on their own, and so on. And then we top slice uh, the, the best ones to move forward. In fact, in the first round of these people, some of them you might recognize, uh, who were announced in Parliament uh, by Aaron Mazzoleni uh, in February, uh, the first 13, in fact, uh, were the top in each, there were 13 different disciplines that were funded. You know, medical engineers, uh, physical, there was only one doctor, you know, the doctors complained. You know, <laughs> that out of 40 doctors, only one got it. We said, yeah, well, that's how the health system works, you know. We need all types. So the system is moving and, uh, uh, and, and now the second round is on and next month we'll be, we'll be announcing the next 40. So that is the first uh, intervention that gives us the ability to shift now, to increase those numbers that we saw falling, falling off and begin uh, to transform the science court in South Africa. Of course, this is occurring in the context of a whole host of interventions, right? I'm aware, for example, that Caprisa for a long time has been investing in capacity development, They're sending people to the US to do short courses, medium courses, long courses. So there's a lot that is happening now. In fact, it's become a problem now. There are too many opportunities that are coming that are coming up. There are a few that I want to highlight that I am personally associated with and that I believe are not exploited maximally, particularly people coming from Will. Because I'm, I've come to talk to Will here and I've come to say to Will, we need applicants. And we need particularly applicants who are women, who are well prepared to apply for this. Um, some of us uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the late 2000s went to speak to Discovery Foundation and said to them that, look, you guys are making a lot of profits. Uh, this is why you're, you're, you're also able to go to the NHS, uh, N NHS in the UK and offer uh, you know, eye surgeries. It's the doctors that we train in our hospitals. If you do not pay attention uh, to the production of academics, you will not make a profit in 10 years time. So you better invest. So Discovery Foundation is investing 100 million uh, over a period of 10 years to train academics at various levels. People in this room have probably applied, they, they find MSCs, PhDs, and so on. But there's this new scheme uh, that we launched this year called the Discovery Foundation Massachusetts General Hospital Fellowship, which will take us African at whatever level of development they are. This is one of the things that we banned ages in. We don't care how old you are, oh. because we know that those of us uh, who've done this long thing of medicine, by the time we qualify, we're usually you know, almost ready to retire. So, so, so we, we can't put age barriers in this. So the Massachusetts General Hospital Fellowship will take somebody from South Africa to go to the MGH to, to do whatever they like hmm? for two years. Okay? It could be clinical training, it could be clinical lab training, it doesn't matter. Okay, fine? As long as, again, you've got a good idea, you're a good guy, and you've got a fine supervisor over there who says, I'm happy to look after you, right? Yeah. So this competition is on. Uh, we did a pilot with UCT last year. Uh, uh, there's a, a young doctor from UCT who's going to do transplant uh, immunology at, at the MGH, and we're going to be calling for applications perhaps before the end of the year, and maybe before Christmas, okay? Uh, and uh, do, do watch out. We want people from this room to, 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 to apply. Um, and then there is another scheme which is funded by NetCare. It's called the Hamilton Naki Clinical Scholarship. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and again, I've come here to advertise, okay? but because we are not getting the right applications, uh, uh, particularly from women, you know, for, uh, for, for this particular scheme. It is another scheme that is designed for people who are already specialist doctors uh, to go and do a PhD or to come back. Maybe you've got this person who's a South African who's just finished a PhD in Oxford and you don't know how to recruit them back. Yeah? Because it's one of the big problems that we have in our system. We've got no way of actually bringing people back. That's why we lose them. Okay, fine. We've got no system. So, so we can do that uh, with here. And then again, just like the National Health Scholars Program, uh, the pay will be equivalent to what you would have earned as a chief specialist or principal specialist, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and, uh, and then you, you, you go and work with whomever you want to work in the world and we will support you to the hilt to do what you, you need to do. The applications, call for applications for Hamilton Naki usually come out in about May, and uh, I'm quite happy to advise people because the big problems, the applicants, they, they are not prepared. Yeah? You know, like, yeah. Before you apply for these things, you must ask, okay, what should I be writing? Right? And, and we're quite happy 
uh, to advise you, uh, which is part of the reason I'm listing these ones, because I'm personally involved uh, with these particular schemes. There's also another old scheme, uh, which uh, was started in 1949, it's very, very old, called the Oxford Nuffield Medical Fellowship. It is funded actually uh, by uh, an Oxford Trust, you know, Lord Northfield of the Morris Car. It's the Morris Car, right? Uh, money from the Morris uh, uh, goes to fund this. And there's a call for a South African to apply every year. It is hugely unacceptable. Yeah? You know, when we, we get too few applications, so much so that the Oxford Trust wants to withdraw it. Yeah. Okay, fine. Right, yeah. So, so last year, they uh, they decided not to not to call because the previous round we had four applications, all right, okay, and uh, uh, so uh, we must use these opportunities. Of course, it is restrictive. It, it sends you to one institution. Uh, it is as restrictive as this one, which also only sends you to Harvard, right? But uh, but these these are great institutions where you can almost always find some connection between what you do. So uh, so I'm encouraging Will. Uh, to field candidates here, right? Uh, to work with us in preparing. There's a certain preparation that is done. You know, all these things are formulated. If you follow the formula, you know, you will be uh, you will be competitive. And of course, uh, again, uh, uh, people in medical sciences are not applying for the roads. I mean, this is now old, yeah? right? Yeah, and also a great opportunity to build careers. The only problem, of course, with the roads is got an age limit. Okay, uh, and you need to apply. Uh, before you are 25 and take up the road before you are 27. That's hugely restrictive, okay, right? right yeah. But what we have been doing at, at UCT, we've been identifying medical students, okay, fine, who are talented, who are at the top 5% of the class. And we make sure they've got the right preparation because all these things need, need the right preparation, right? Before you apply, you need to make sure that they're not just, uh, 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 they, they're not nerds, huh? they're not just academic, you know, people who read the book only, huh? you know, here, uh, they're, they're one people who are also a little bit uh, uh, in touch, you know, with the world and, and showing social leadership. And all those things can be built in, okay, but in these people because they usually have those those abilities. So these are some of the things that, for example, will might might consider doing, working with medical students, uh, working with colleagues, you know, to try to take advantage of these particular uh, uh, opportunities in a sea of a whole host of opportunities. That have, uh, that, have, that have now become uh, available. Now, talking about undergraduate students in terms of how we build the science cohort, we must not forget that where the people that we really need to target are the medical students, which is why I was very excited to see the medical students here. Yeah, I mean, this is just fantastic. Because we need to find them before their minds are set. Huh? And, uh, you know, uh, you, the tree, you need to bend the tree while it is still mild. So, what we we, we we be doing in Cape Town is that we are attending to that issue, and we have taken the traditional MBCH program, which you are seeing here, that has got six years, and we've created two types of interventions, right? Uh, uh, an intercalated BSc, which I know this university has because I did it when I was here uh, in Cape Town. We have forgotten about it when we introduced this new curriculum, yeah. Uh, and, and we also, uh, so, so what then happens is that after third year, medical students can then go and join the BSc Med Honors Program at Health College. Huh? Right? So, so there are medical students here, and they go and join an Honors Program. The beauty about an Honors Program is that you get taught techniques huh? right, for four months, and then you get to do a project. I mean, you, you have a, a really great experience of doing science, okay? And then uh, the, our honors program has got streams. We have a microbiology stream, immunology stream, genetic stream, physiology stream, and so on. Right? So you can take any particular stream, and uh, in this, and then after finishing your year, you then can come back and finish the MBCHB. Okay, right? Now, sometimes the project goes so well that uh, you 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 you've started some preliminary work here, uh, but you're not ready to do your PhD. So you continue working on it, and then when you, once you finish your MBCHB, you do your PhD. So it becomes an MBCHB uh, honors PhD. Alternatively, right? Alternatively, and this year we might be having someone actually is going to do this. Uh, you, you hit on a great project, okay, in your honors, which is quite clear that it will give you a PhD, and, and you continue, you continue relentlessly into your PhD, and then come back to the clinical years and, and finish it. Now, th this is the sort of intervention that was made 
in the U.S. after the Second World War. You know, the so-called MD-PhD program. So, so this is nothing new. Right? Yeah, this, this is this is this is nothing new. And, and clearly, it's aimed at a at a particular uh, group in the class, the top five percent of the class, is what you are targeting here. Uh, people who can handle this. And, and it turns out that um, in terms of evidence now, uh, uh, people who've had this type of experience. It's what predicts who's going to be an academic in systems that have used this. In the UK, they, they do use this quite a bit. Uh, and then, of course, in the U US, uh, where they've got a different system, uh, they, they do use the MD, PhD uh, kind of training. And people, if you compare uh, in a case controlled manner, those who've done MD, PhD versus those who've just done MD, uh, the MD, PhD does predict those physicians who will ultimately go on to become, uh, to become physicians. So we've haggled with our Senate. To change all the rules in the faculty book to create this so that we start intervening early, intervening efficiently, creating modular indicated programs uh, so that we can move forward. The other one, in fact, that we're going to introduce now is going to be an MB, MBCHB MPH, hmm? right? MBCHB MPH, uh, which, is, which, is, which, is, uh, which is also going to be set in here. It's just that we have not managed to convince the powers that be, but we will get them, you know, maybe next year, okay, right? Yeah, so that you've got a, a hugely dynamic kind of environment where we're training professionals and the majority will be there. 95% must, must move. We need to train people for the health system, but, but there is another group that we must move into these kinds of programs and really create that cohort of people who are going to become physician scientists uh, in, in, in the world. It's a key in a, in, a, in, a, in a system to have physician scientists. Uh, and, uh, and if you look at you know, uh, the medical doctors who won the Nobel Prize, you, you will see actually that it quite a significant proportion of them. There may be an association, okay, between this type of intervention and those who may well, uh, uh, those medical, those physicians who are, who are likely to, to win the Nobel Prize later. So, so I'm saying that the interventions that we are making to transform the science cohort in terms of numbers and in terms of quality uh, must occur at all levels. They must occur uh, right through the life course. This is a live course type intervention at the undergraduate level as well as at the uh, postgraduate level. Yes. Nice yeah. Yeah. In 1980, yes. when I was in second year yes. at Cook's University, yeah. they had this program Which where you started your life. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes. And in 1980, some of you would have met yeah. Trevor Mandel. Yes, yes, yes. He did this. Yeah. In 1980, he was a Rhodes Scholar, yes, yes, and for yeah. those that don't know, yeah. he's with the Gates Foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. New curriculum is great in terms of maintaining the interest of the students, but we need to make sure that there's depth and roots and we're built so that we can be able to train people who are going to solve yeah. our problems uh, in, in the future. Stop but, the first, yeah. Yes. You managed to do this mm. when you were at UK. Yes, yes, yes. yes. We've had battles to do this. Mm. Yes. Every year, it's a battle. So I hope one of the things you do before you leave uh, Durban in this visit <laughs> is to convince the higher beings about this inter the, this training of this integrated exactly. program. All we need here in UK is a champion. Now, who's the champion? We've had champions. We can work on this. We just read the books of the Senate and everything else, and we write and say, this is, this, is, this is how it's going to be done. Huh? <laughs> right, yeah. No, it's, so, not, it's about info. So I don't want to detract yeah. us from the rest of the talk, yes. but I think, you know, Kunega as head of micro would appreciate the, you know, this is an opportunity. We have the cream of the crop coming through. Yeah. We have a rich research environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have some bureaucrats uh, being an obstacle to uh, kids with a lot of initiatives. Of course, yes, of course. I mean, this is something we can work with, uh, you know, uh, with Will. Yes, so can so, you just yeah. request mm -hmm. that yeah. we allow you to finish whilst we're recording this? Okay. Yeah. Again, I beg yes. <laughs> yes, well, I'm finished, actually. Uh, and, 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 uh, and as I said, I've come to learn here, right? Yeah, I, I've really come to learn. And, and, and uh, I've come to find out what data has Will have when it's work. Uh, what is the status of women? In academic leadership in UK today, and are we making progress? You know, right? Are, are we making progress? And, and and this is stimulated by that nature review, because from that nature uh, review I showed you, you 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 you, you can see that uh, data helps in, in in knowing where we are, uh, so that we can move forward. Uh, so that's the, qu the first question I have. The second question that I have: What 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 are your targets? What 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 are the goals 
of uh, of, of will, uh, which will obviously be informed by where we are and where we want to be. Where, where do we want to be in twenty twenty three? In in ten years time, in terms of our work, uh, and then I've come to invite you to compete, right? To to, to, to compete in this particular schemes in our department in Cape Town, uh, the Department of Medicine. Uh, one of the things that people get told as they come is that um, uh, if you do not have an entity, you are a non-entity. Okay. Now, entity means a fund. The UCT, at UCT, when you've got a grant, yeah, right, uh, you, you, you get an entity. So we say, oh, you know, now the first thing you do when you join the department is to write a grant, is to compete. Now I'm saying that because in all of these schemes, like the Discovery Foundation schemes, we write 30, 30 applications at a time. There are 10 Discovery Foundation uh, uh, fellowships for the country every year, right? Yeah. Up until recently, we were getting five of them. Okay, right? Because why? We were putting in 30 applications. You, do, you know, right? Yeah. Now, now they've, they've, uh, I think now they are, we're complaining now. They're, they're discriminating against us because we're getting three or four, right? Yeah. But what I'm illustrating is the issue of competition. We must compete aggressively in all of these opportunities that are available to us. And, 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 and this organization ought to be working out, in fact, I've come to know from you, how many people are you going to be uh, uh, placing for the National Health Scholars Program in, in the next round, in 2014, in 2015, in 2016, right? How many National Scholars are you preparing here? How many Rhodes Scholars are you preparing, right, uh, to, to move forward, right? And, 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 and importantly, and, and this, I think this is crucial in terms of your existence, because you exist with regard to advocacy. You can't do advocacy, of course, without data. Okay? You need data okay? to, to, to advocate. Otherwise, you don't move anything. Right? And what are you doing to influence policy to close the gender gap? There must be a gender gap right? Yeah? Uh, in, in medical science in, in this country. What is Will doing to actually interact at the local level, at the national level, and even at the international level to, to, to try to shift the scales there? Because this is an intractable problem. The problem of gender inequity. It's going to require new thinking. It's actually an area of science in itself, as to uh, because it has to do with organization of society. It, it has to do how do we reorganize society so that society doesn't think that you know the scientist is a man, <laughs> right? Okay, you know. So, so, so it's actually an area of scholarship, and, and that scholarship will probably come from groups such as this that are applying their minds about how to solve these particular problems. So, so, so these are my questions, right? These are, these are my questions. I'd like to learn, I'd like to collaborate, and I'd like us to interact as we move forward to try to transform the science cohort in this country. And because I believe that the opportunity for doing so has never been there, historically. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you.